So um, it's good to have you back on, John. Um, I know we talked, oh, I can't remember exactly how long ago it was, but um, right on time. <laughs> we have another reason to have you back on the show. And the reason I wanted to have you come on was to kind of talk about some of the things that have been going on with respect to this assault weapons ban, uh, but the, also more specifically to the idea that there aren't many cases where citizens are actually defending themselves against mass shootings. I actually did a video just yesterday talking about how they create the situation and that they have that they fight for these gun free zones, but then turn around and tell us and almost mock us and say, ha ha, you guys actually don't stop mass shooters as much as you think you do. And this one is just a one off. And so based on your experience and research that you have done, what are, what are the true realities regarding self-defense shootings um, where civilians are not only just stopping mass shootings, but just stopping shootings altogether and protecting themselves with firearms? All right. Well, we've put together a long list of cases where civilians legally carrying guns have stopped what police say otherwise would have been mass public shootings. Ten cases in the last 12 months. We have 21 cases since the beginning of Altogether, in recent years, we have 63 cases uh, that we've identified. And, you know, it's they rarely get media coverage. Uh, some of these are very dramatic cases. Uh, you would think that they would get coverage, uh, not just for the heroic nature, but also because they coincide with other cases which have gotten coverage. So I'll give you a, a couple examples. Uh, you know, obviously, everybody knows the Parkland shooting. Few people would know that just uh, shortly after that, not very far away, also in Florida, there was an attack at an elementary school uh, that was having a big event at a park next to the school. They had hundreds of students there, had parents, had teachers. A man came up, started firing his gun. Uh, what happened, though, was that there was uh, a vendor there who had a, a concealed carry permit who seriously wounded the attacker and stopped him before he was able to hurt anybody. You won't find any media coverage of that outside of uh, the local Florida media market. And you would think the Parkland shooting was still getting news coverage. Yeah. But, you know, people would see, you know, here's a school shooting where it was stopped before anybody was harmed versus the Parkland case where we banned guns in the place and just point out the differences. Another example is, uh, you know, the Pulse nightclub shooting. Mm -hmm. That was for a long time the worst mass public shooting in U.S. history. And uh, there you have a situation where just literally seven days after that, there was a, a very similar attack at a nightclub in South Carolina. Uh, the attacker there had shot three people, was shooting at a fourth person when someone with a permit concealed handgun uh, pulled out his gun and seriously wounded the attacker, stopping the attack. The difference is that Florida was one of 10 states that banned people being able to carry permitted concealed handguns in uh, establishments that got more than 50 percent of their revenue from alcohol. Yeah, South like Carolina was one of the 40 states that allowed people to be able to go and carry. Again, the only media coverage that you would see in the South Carolina case, and the guy had over 100 rounds of ammunition left on him when he was stopped, uh, was in the local South Carolina media market. In the f few cases that do get national news coverage, the media often completely mucks up the story. I'll give you one example of that. We had the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. Mm -hmm. Literally just three days after that, there was an attack at a Kroger grocery store in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where a racist was going after black customers that were there. And uh, what got the national media attention was not just the racist aspect, but that the murderer uh, had turned to a customer and said, whites don't shoot whites, making it look like here you have this white murderer assuring this white customer that he wasn't going to go and shoot him because they were both white. <clears throat> the problem is, is that the national media coverage left out the beginning of the quote. The, the full quote was, please don't shoot me, whites don't shoot whites. And so rather than the murderer assuring the customer that the customer had nothing to worry about, the customer had a permanent concealed handgun that he was pointing at the murderer. 
and the murderer was begging the customer not to shoot him. Wow. And it made that it made the story a lot more complicated because here you had obviously this racist, but you also had a white customer coming to the aid to protect the black customers that were there. And I guess that didn't fit into the narrative that uh, national media wanted to go and say. So, you know, I uh, was watching NBC's Meet the Press, and Chuck Todd spent like four and a half minutes on the story. And I wrote him back, because we used to be able to text at that time. Uh I wrote him back to saying, you know, you missed the beginning of the quote. Here's all these local media outlets in Louisville that have the full quote that's there. And, uh, you know, maybe in your next show, you want to go and revisit this and uh, and kind of correct the record on it. Of course, he blocked me after that and <laughs> never corrected the record on his show. But uh, what happened was uh, the customer there shot the murderer. Uh, he was seriously wounded, got into his car, drove about a mile down the road before he passed out. And it was at that point that the police were able to apprehend him, uh, passed out in his car. Uh, but again, you had a concealed carry permit holder that had stopped the attack that's there. So, I mean, I can give you lots of cases. There are many cases, you know, just uh, recently, a month or so ago, there was a case in, uh, in West Virginia where a man had uh, a rifle, was shooting at a crowd of people, and a woman with a permanent concealed handgun stopped the attack. Yeah. There are lots of those cases, and they rarely get any type of national news coverage, and it really affects the debate. I, I've kind of gotten to the end of my rope in terms of the media bias. It's just so overwhelming. My guess is that the entire debate that we have right now would be very different if just a couple things happened. One, they would give some coverage to these heroes that go and stop these attacks and do so accurately. But two, um, as you point out, we keep on seeing these attacks over and over again in places where guns are banned. And it's not just that. Look at the Buffalo shooter uh, who went to the grocery store and was attacking the the black customers that were there. If you read his manifesto, Right, uh, he has a long discussion about why he picked the target that he did. Right up front, he says he wanted to go after a target where victims weren't going to have permanent concealed handguns. Exactly. He makes it very clear. Do you find any media coverage on news? No, they just completely ignored it. I on, a, on our website at crimeresearch.org, we have literally dozens of cases where these murderers have left diaries or left other statements about why they picked the particular target that they did. And they leave out the fact that these guys keep on saying, we want to go to a place where victims can't defend themselves. Here's the thing. I think the media, in some sense, is responsible for many of these attacks. If you read the diaries and manifestos, these individuals crave media attention. They desperately crave media attention. Time after time, you'll see them say things. If I can only kill more people than such and such killed, I can get even more media attention. Look, it's clear they know the more people they kill, the more media attention that they can get. I'm not arguing that we should get rid of the First Amendment. I'm not arguing we should rewrite it. But it gives us a window into what we can do in order to stop it. And the key thing there is that if you can get somebody there quickly— with a gun to be able to go and stop it, you can reduce the carnage and you can reduce the media coverage that they're going to get. You know, it's, and and yet the media plays up these individuals' names. They refuse to go and mention the types of things that could actually stop it. Instead, they go and have initial news coverage about how they think the person got the gun or what gun that was used. And yet you will search in vain for any news stories that go and say, and we've had a school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, in a place that banned guns, or the Tulsa hospital shooting in a place where guns were banned, or quote from the manifesto. These guys were combing through the Buffalo shooter's manifesto, but you won't find anything there about why he wanted to go and pick a place where the victims were defenseless. 
These people may be crazy in some sense, but they're not stupid. Yeah. Their goal is to get media coverage, and they know how to go about doing it. I think at this point, we've reached a, we've reached a point in this conversation where I, I would like to think um, the motivations started off genuine um, as far as the other side um, with respect to this conversation. But more and more, I start to realize it's almost become a contest. It's not even really about the idea of saving lives or protecting people. It's seemingly just become this contest of let me get my points and make my points and prove to you why we're right and you're wrong. And even when confronted with reality and seeing what it really is with respect to people being able to use firearms to defend themselves, they still won't even acknowledge it and they won't admit it because then their ego gets invested and they don't want to have to deal with the fact of saying, you know what, maybe you guys are right about this and maybe we should look at this from a different perspective. But um, we never get that. We don't. We constantly get them reinforcing whatever their narrative is. And then even when we want to have the conversation about it, they don't want to have that conversation. They rather stay in their bubbles. We on the other side have been sitting. We've been itching to get outside of our bubble and have these conversations. I know you have, and I'm pretty sure you've experienced many a times, as I've read and you've told me, where they've actually tried to block you. Or when somebody knew you were coming on to have the conversation, they didn't want to come on the show anymore. I've experienced that myself. So at the end of the day, I think the onus, by and large, and I'm, maybe I can't put it on them, but maybe the onus is on the people in the middle who we're trying to talk to who are the largest group of people who have the biggest influence in deciding how a lot of these laws are passed, maybe the onus is on them to hold both sides accountable in terms of having this conversation, honestly. But there's there's a level of apathy I, there. I understand. Um, go ahead. Right. I understand completely where you're coming from. Look, but the problem is, is the people in the middle don't even know what the alternative arguments are often True. because – it's so heavily censored. Even Fox these days is doing a generally a very poor job of covering these types of things. Uh, you know, I think it's kind of the changing of the guard over there has yeah. affected a lot of the coverage on their website, for example. But, um, you know, if you listen to the mainstream media, if you listen to, you know, you read the New York Times and the Washington Post and, you know, news stories on any place else, how are they even going to know that most of these attacks occur in places where guns are banned? Why, how would they even know that 96% of the attacks occur, the successful attacks occur in places where guns are banned? They wouldn't know that. No, you're they, right. You're right, because I've even, sorry, um, I, just even in my research, whenever I'm doing a lot of my research as far as putting together the videos that I put together, when I do an initial Google search, I know to ignore probably the first 10 links that I see. Because I know those links are going to be heavily skewed and biased towards a anti-gun narrative. And not only until I, oh, get yeah, them, sure. yeah, until I get 10, maybe 15, 20 links in, then I'll start to get some countering, some countering arguments as to why this may be or why this may not be. Um, and then after that, I got to keep going even further to get pro-gun arguments. So I, I, I totally well, agree with you. Well, even places regard. like my website has been shadow banned yeah. and stuff. And so you have to... Go just directly to crimeresearch.org to get like the list of all the cases where people with concealed handguns have stopped mass public shootings or to go and find the data on how frequently these uh, attackers go and pick gun free zones or to go and read all the compilation that we've done for the diaries and manifestos where they explicitly talk about why they picked the targets that they did because they want wanted to avoid uh, places where people could defend themselves. You know, the thing is, um, you really have to go out of your way for the New York Times or the Associated Press to have the stories that they've had this week to go and claim that uh, it's very rare yeah. that people use guns defensively. You know, at one time, the media used to feel obligated to go and report both sides of the story. Now they don't. Now they can go to some, you know, source that supports their position, and that's all they will go and run with. You know, the fact that we have many dozens of cases where missed public shootings have been stopped by people, according to police, uh, you know, they don't deal with. They don't even mention, it. you know, you're the person that you talk about in the middle who thinks – that they're well informed would never even know that there's an alternative position out there. Yeah. 
No, no, you're absolutely right. And, and like you said, you're at your wits end. I'm, I, I get incredibly frustrated by it every single day. And the, the odd thing is, is even with respect to the videos that I make, um, it's so, so much of the information you have to, you have to kind of flesh out. Um, but if you flesh it out too much, the video becomes too long. And then the people who are in the middle who probably should be seeing this won't watch it. So it's almost like I'm forced to try to oversimplify very complex issues. Um, but nonetheless, um, here we are, <laughs> um, you know, and I, I thank you for the, the, the work and the research that you do on your end, because a lot of the information that like I've said this before, a lot of the information that a lot of people do have with respect to this issue on the pro gun side, a lot of them don't even realize it's come from you and your work and the research that you've done over the years and the books that you've written about it. Um, so I personally want to thank you for that. And like I said, I always enjoy having you. Well, on. it wouldn't be out there. People wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for people like you who are able to go and make it accessible for people. Absolutely. So I, I appreciate you being there. Absolutely. But it's just, uh, you know, we all do our part here. But uh, I try my best to get op-eds and, and general interest places. I had something in Newsweek and Real Clear Politics this week. A few weeks ago, I had something in the Wall Street Journal. But, you know, there's only so much yeah. uh, I can do with my small organization. And it's, you know, yeah. well, people like you have a big audience, and it's important that you're there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, I'll, I'll continue to keep doing what I can do in order to get your message out there and get your information out there, um, you know, whether it be via Twitter, YouTube, whatever the case may be, and also having you on on the podcast. I'm pretty sure you'll be back on here again um, to counter a lot of the narrative that's going on. And hopefully um, this video serves as the catalyst for that, where people start to actually go start going to your website more. And I'm um, speaking on that. Um, can you just let people know where they can go to get the information, your books, your research, so forth and so on? Sure. Well, our website is crimeresearch.org, crimeresearch.org, and links to all our research is right there at the top, and uh, uh, our books are listed there at the bottom if, if people want to look at them. But it's just, I think the links at the top on our research will provide them the sources for all the things that you and I have just been talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to come on and talk to me about this. I look forward to having you back on. You know, we talk a lot about empowerment in this country, except for when it comes to the Second Amendment. However, I can't think of anything more empowering than having the most effective tool to protect you and your family. So help me spread this message by liking and sharing this video with everyone you know. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment because the Second Amendment, when it said militia, it wasn't talking about the government. It was talking about you. Also, if you want to know where to find the I'm the Militia shirt and merchandise, click the I'm the Militia link in the description section of this video. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And most importantly, make sure you hit that bell symbol.